G'day there, you're watching the Aussie BIM Guru. Today I've got a tutorial which sort of follows on from a previous one that I've done in Dynamo where we looked at how you can find the closest grid intersection to an element's location. If you haven't already seen this, I recommend that you at least watch the introduction so you understand the logic of what we're going to do here in this tutorial. Because I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to be using Rhino inside Revit instead. And we're going to be able to take advantage of Grasshopper. And you'll see a few shortcuts that Dynamo didn't necessarily offer us which we're going to take advantage of here. And this will probably show you why sometimes Rhino Inside can be a better alternative uh, for Dynamo, even when you're handling Revit elements and Revit data. It just depends on the workflow. Anyway, without further ado, let's get started. Okay, um, so let's begin. So I'm currently in Revit and I'm going to boot up Rhino Inside. So under add-ins, I've essentially went and hit this Rhino 7 button which gives me this Rhinoceros tab. Um, if you haven't used Rhino Inside before, one thing I do like to do that I recommend you do is giving some space for Rhino on the side of Revit uh, because the Revit window will take some level of priority over Rhino. So I'm gonna open up Rhino here. Um, and in this case, I'm just gonna give it some room. In this case, I've maximized my perspective viewport. So I've just maximized this and I'll just open up the layers tab and zoom out a bit. Um, so in this case, I'm just gonna boot up Grasshopper. And we're gonna have to begin by collecting some Revit elements. So for now, I'm just gonna work with Grasshopper on, on top of Revit. And I'm just gonna make a new script and save it. And I'm just gonna call this uh, working. So we're gonna to need to collect two things. We're gonna collect in this case, um, maybe just we'll focus on some elements in the model. I'm wondering if we just collect everything we can see in 3D. So I might go to my active view. And in this case, I'm going to go to my Revit tab. And I'm going to, in this case, be collecting uh, the, the elements by category and also the elements by whether they're selectable in view. So in this case, I'm going to need to use some filters to do this. I'm going to use a selectable in view filter. And I'm also going to be using a category filter. In this case, I'm going to go and collect a model categories picker. So in this case, I'm going to be collecting um, an analytical category, in this case, grids. So I'm going to just find, uh, I might need to specify it by name, actually. I think it's not an analytical category, it's an annotation category, sorry. So I'm going to pick grids. And in this case, I'm going to be using this as my category filter. And from document, I'm going to be querying, uh, sorry, I'm going to query elements in order to obtain the grids in my model. I'm also going to remove the limit in this case, so I'm not going to limit the number of elements I'm collecting. That's sort of there just to be safe in case you're going to go and collect, say, 10,000 elements, which could be quite slow. So now I have my grids. Um, so in this case, um, I also have the count, which isn't really that useful, but we have the elements at least. You can always just go and remove the count output if you want to keep things simple. From here, we need to go and get the curve of the elements. So I think in this case, if I look for curve, Revit, um, we're just going to be getting the elements curve, which is just located here under the Revit tab in elements. And from that, I'm going to get my grid curves. And you can see over here in Revit, the preview appearing for them. And also in Rhino, we should now have the, the grids and also their curve. So in this case, we're going to proceed forward with these curves. Now you may need to extend your grids a little bit so that they actually intersect with each other. In this case, we can use the extend curve node um, from Grasshopper. So I'm going to extend my curves and I'm just going to add a number slider. I'm going to start from zero up to 5,000 up to 25,000. And I'm going to extend both ends of the grids. And now you can see in Rhino, I have the ability to overextend my grids if I want to. In this case, all my grids will intersect, so it doesn't really matter. Um, but there we go. So now we need to find the intersections of every single grid. Now this is the step in, in a Revit that usually takes quite a long time using Dynamo. But in this case, I'm just going to be using a multiple curve intersect node. So in this case, I believe it's under physical multiple curves. And this node is beautiful. It does exactly what we need. So from all the curves, it's going to find all the points. And not only is it going to return the points, but it's also going to return the index of the intersecting elements at one list and the other. So we can use this to determine which grids are hitting which grids. Um, pretty amazing. So in this case, I'm going to have to go and retrieve some data about the elements. Uh, in this case, I'm going to be retrieving their name. So I'm going to get the, the name of the grids. And in this case, I can use this name in order to determine the intersection of the grids. So I'm going to use a list item node to call on elements from my original list of names. 
at index A and index B. So in this case, I should now have the names of the grids as they occur. So you can see I've got alpha and numerical. And I'm then going to concatenate them together to form my grid references. Now I can see in one list I'm getting my alpha and the other I'm getting my numerical. I'm going to put my alpha first. So I'm going to concatenate A onto B. Now you can see we have those grid references for those 56 points. So much more direct and much more linear than it would be in Dynamo and super, super quick. Uh, must, have, must always reinforce how quick that is. I'm now going to go back in this case and get my selectable in view filter. And in this case, my view is going to be my active view. So in this case, I'm going to go to Revit and I'm going to get my active graphical view. Now, sometimes you might want to add a stream filter here to stop the, the script from running straight away at the very beginning. So I'm going to go call on a stream filter. And in filter gate one, I'm going to feed the active view and in gate zero, I'm going to feed nothing. And to the front of this, I'm going to add a Boolean toggle, which you can just set to false by default. But when it's true, it sends through the view. And this can essentially stop your script from running to begin with. Because you can see now, if I send through true, it sends through my active view to the view input to build the filter. So that's just a way you can stop your script from running as soon as you open it. As well as this, I'm then going to filter the elements, and this is going to return all the elements that it can see in the model in this case. So at the moment, um, we may potentially want to limit some of these elements, but for now, I'm just going to have a quick look at what sort of elements I'm dealing with. So I've actually got a few things I probably don't want to see, such as levels. So what I might do is just turn off annotation categories in this view. And then in Rhino, I'm just going to recompute my script. And this should limit how many elements I can see. In this case, I should hopefully be able to see just a few less elements. For example, now I can't see my grids. Now I can see a few things like views, which don't necessarily make sense. Um, but what I'm going to try for now, at least, is just going to get an element preview. And some elements won't be able to build a preview, potentially. It just depends on the element itself. But we should get meshes for some elements, at least. So in this case, I might just want to count the number of elements that are appearing in my lists. And in this case, I need to use a lists length in order to determine this. This should give me the number of items in each list. Now, in this case, um, I can see that some, some lists should have zero elements. So I might just double check if some of these elements are actually being managed out naturally. In this case, if I flatten my output, I can see some of my lists are containing less than, less than one. So in this case, I'm gonna say, I'm just gonna check if it equals to zero. So do any of these list lengths equal zero? And if they do, I'm gonna end up basically dispatching these elements out because I don't really actually want to see those elements. So there are other ways you could do this, probably more direct ways that don't deal with geometry. Um, but in this case, I think that'll probably just be one way we could do it. So I'm going to dispatch. I could even cull, actually. Um, but for now, actually, I will cull because culling will just get rid of the things that don't meet that criteria. So if it's not equal to zero, I want to keep them. If it is, then I want to get rid of them. So I'm going to say if it's not equal to zero, uh, then we're going to filter out the geometry. So now we should hopefully be able to filter these elements out. Now in this case, I might need to maybe run a mesh join across these elements geometry first. And some of these elements should just have no mesh, ideally. Yeah, so none of the, some of them will be null. We could also filter them out by is null or do a clean tree, but we do want to be able to filter these out in parallel. Um, so what I might even actually be able to do is just get an is null or null item and test these items for whether they are null. And then I can actually just filter them out in this case in a slightly more direct manner. So in this case, I'm going to say if it's true, and I believe in this case, I'm going to invert my pattern so that I only keep the elements that do contain meshes, but I'm also going to apply this to my element list as well. There we go. And from these meshes, I can then, in this case, just obtain a bounding box from these elements. 
And in this case, I can just run, I believe one bounding box per mesh. So in this case, I should just have one bounding box. And from this, I can obtain its volume to get the middle of that element. And now we should be dealing in this case with a point for each of these elements. There we go. So now in Rhino, we can see we have one element for each, or well, one point for each element. And let's, let's go clean just a little bit of this geometry up just to keep things a little bit tidier. And this will lighten the load that we're placing on Revit and also on Rhino as well. So now we're just seeing the elements and I'm also just gonna potentially have to turn off in this case, my elements. There we go. So a little bit cleaner and we can see we're actually collecting a lot more elements than we did in Revit actually. Um, so in this case, we have probably actually succeeded in collecting more things. So now I'm just gonna be dealing with the elements and their location. So I do need to deconstruct the location so it sits on the same plane as the grid intersections. So in this case, um, I'm just gonna be deconstructing point. So I'm gonna deconstruct this point into its X, Y, and Z values. And I'm gonna construct the point, but I'm only gonna construct the point with X and Y. And this will essentially flatten those points. And I'll just hide these other nodes. And now we're just dealing with everything on a common plane. So in this case, I can now find the closest point to these grid intersections. So in this case, I'm gonna be using closest point. And in this case, I'm gonna find the closest point in a point collection. So I'm gonna be taking these points to search and the grid intersections to search from. So I'm gonna be taking these points and these points. And this is super quick. Um, you can remember in Dynamo potentially, that was a really slow step to manage. Um, it was very slow and you had to use quite a few steps to find the nearest point. But in this case, we're just finding the closest point. And the great thing about this is it returns the index of the closest point from the list. So as you can guess, we can just run a list item over the name of the grids by that index. And done, we have the closest grid intersection to each of those grids. Super quick, super easy. Now you may recall that we do need to add a parameter that can house this value. And in this case, it's gonna be in the form of a string. So I'm gonna to go to my project parameters tab and I'm just gonna add a parameter. I'll just add a project parameter. I'm gonna call this grid intersection. Uh, whoops, and I'm gonna make it text-based and I'm gonna make it vary per group. So it can, it can be different from group to group. I'm gonna check all. And again, you might recall that we have to go and find a couple of ancillary subcategories uh, that aren't typically being found by the select all function. Things like gutters and fascias are quite crucial. And building pads and stair subcomponents. But otherwise at this point, um, we are almost ready to go and push this value back to Revit um, using a set parameter. So pretty direct, pretty quick and pretty easy if you know how to process geometry in Grasshopper. And if you don't, well, now you do. So in this case, I'm just gonna recompute so that that parameter is now present in Grasshopper's interpretation of Revit. I'm just gonna save my script. And in this case, I just need to use an element set element parameter. Now, again, when I'm setting an element parameter, I like to use a stream filter to stop the data from passing through all the time. So I'm gonna get a stream filter. And in this case, I'm gonna control it using a button because I only want it to happen once. So my gate is controlled by a button. And in this case, uh, at the very least, we need a parameter key in order to set a value. So in this case, I'm gonna get that grid intersection parameter and I'll just make sure I've typed that with the right case grid intersection yep so this is going to be the key that we feed through when the gate is active and I'm going to feed that through to the key now our elements in this case are going to be back here where we culled the list and the values are going to be that grid intersection so when I hit this button ideally it should go and populate those values so I'll just hit it once and it's gonna go find all 1,237 elements and hopefully it's populated their grid intersection and lo and behold, it has. So let's just go and check a few elements just to cross check it worked. In this case, I'll check uh, this column, B3. So B3. Let's go and check uh, this staircase, C6. C6. Um, and finally, let's check a door, G5. 
So we got G5. And you can see that that was extremely quick. It was almost instantaneous to run across more than a thousand elements in Revit. But really the time saving that we had here really came from this closest point node and also this intersection node uh, to find the intersecting grids, which is back um, here with the multiple curve intersection. So super powerful, super quick, and a really strong use case for Rhino inside for something that Dynamo struggles at a little bit more. So hopefully you found that useful and you can apply it to your own projects as well. So there we go, um, a little bit more direct and faster than a Dynamo workflow. Obviously you have to use a bit of deployment in order to manage Rhino inside Revit, but assuming you can set that up, you can see that sometimes you can get a faster and more effective outcome because sometimes Grasshopper is a little bit more developed when it comes to dealing with geometry and intersections. Anyway, that's all for today. If you're not already following and subscribing, feel free to do so. And hopefully I'll see you in future videos like this one. Thanks, take care, bye.